It's about two by three feet, and frankly, I don't know where this painting is. It's in Sioux Falls somewhere, I think. This is called Elk Dreamer, and it's, in my opinion, one of the best things he ever did. Again, he did it very quickly. Most of the paint that's on it is, is put on with his hands, or he would just grab a T-shirt and take it off and dip it in paint and, you know, run it over the canvas. And um, one of the things Dr. Howe taught him was that a piece should be balanced any of four ways. And occasionally, he would give them assignments so that every 15 minutes, they'd have to turn their painting a quarter turn. And this is one of those paintings. He had it hanging one way, and, and Judge Pearsall, who bought it, has it hanging another way. And that's fine with both of them. It's, it could be hanging one of the other ways. He, he didn't care. He just, he just wanted uh, an expression of his emotion. And in this case, it was an expression of the, of the elk dreamer who carried the love medicine. This is a very small watercolor that I believe has been recently auctioned off as part of a federal suit. It, uh, it's only about 8 by 10, and he did it in about 10 minutes. He just dashed it off because he had extra watercolors on his palette and didn't want to waste them. I love this piece. I think it's a really strong piece. Often when he worked fast, he worked best. This is called Prejudice, and it's one of those things that he did in his studio back when he first came here when he was afraid to come out. It's a huge piece, and it's in the collection of the Department of the Interior. What is it, about five by eight feet? It's, it's extremely powerful. He couldn't afford paint in those days, so a lot of that is house paint. I don't know how long that's going to survive. It'll probably start peeling one of these days. But that uh, was one of his expressions of the emotion that he felt at that time. And then he went on and did a lot of abstract pieces, and I've put them all together because, to me, they're some of his best work. One of the things that is our regret, all of us who knew him well, is that he was getting ready to do a major show in Paris this fall. And what they wanted from him was abstracts, which was his first love. And I believe what he was best at was just portraying raw emotion. And the fact that we'll never get to see those paintings is too bad. But these are some of his early ones. And this is one I watched him paint. It's very large and very powerful. People were continually going, oh, I see a bird up there, or I see that he would get really upset, <laughs> turn it over. <laughs> this is one that started out to just be a portrait of, of our dining room table and, and disappeared into an abstract. It's a small piece, and it's a beautiful piece. Judge Pearsall owns this one, and I, I love this one a lot. This is one that the, is in the collection of the Fine Arts Department, and it's, again, one of his early pieces that he did with Dr. Howe. This is one of my favorites of all of his abstracts. It no longer exists. He painted over it. I was really mad at him. But that's what he would do if, if, he, if he didn't feel that people appreciated it or if he'd had it lying around too long or if he ran out of canvas. I know of at least a half a dozen paintings that have three, four paintings underneath them. You know, you never knew what you'd find when you'd come home. I believe this one turned into a still life. This is another early one that he particularly loved and, and recreated this theme over and over over the years. This is just a watercolor of the top of his studio <coughs> table. It's kind of another warm-up piece. He didn't think much of it. I believe this one is in the collection of Tom Brokaw. I'm not sure. I think this may be what's painted over that other one. But um, 
he would he would create these very dark and looming landscapes, and he called them all West River. And they were visions of home. He really missed West River, living here. This one is called Cannonball River, and he painted it before I knew him. Now I'm going into all of the landscapes because that's how I tried to group these for the kids, and so that's how I'm keeping them together. He, he could dash these things off in 10 minutes and often did, but he had such an incredible sense of place that, that you always felt cold if he meant cold or hot if he meant hot. And um, I've always loved his landscapes just for that sense of place that sense of knowing exactly how to paint what was around him. Most people didn't want this from him. It didn't have any feathers in it. But some people did, and he was always pleased when that happened because this is part of what he wanted to do with his career, is, is do landscapes and do interiors and do abstracts and, and, and let himself go in those directions. And having to make a living at him at it often pulled him back and he wasn't able to do these kinds of things as often as he wished. I love this piece. Isn't that wonderful? That's just the river down behind the house. This is over at the uh, dining hall at USD and it's a huge piece. It was based on a on a traditional parflesh design that he'd been working with for years. And we had the students from the art department actually um, help create the piece because he was really sick at the time and couldn't do it. But he he's the one who came up with the design and mixed the colors and did everything else. I, I think Peter Vogley painted the medallions and Nancy Losacker, God help her, hung it somehow. You know, it's you know it's about 12 feet long. It's a huge thing. If you go over to the Lakota Dining Hall, there it is. It's up the whole wall. But they got it done in two weeks. This is another of the medallions. They're over on the other wall. And these are all traditional beadwork designs that he remembered from his childhood. And had Peter translate it to paint for him. They're beautiful. I think they're about three feet in diameter. This is a mural that he was commissioned to the Denver Chamber of Commerce by the new airport that they built down there, the one where nothing ever works. I've looked for this several times, and you know, they claim it's in the first concourse, and I'm sure it is, but I've never found that building yet. Um, they commissioned 10 Indian artists to recreate ancient life on the plains. And this is called Prayer for Peace. It's a huge thing. He did it in his studio, and then they sent a truck up and took it away. It's about 8 by 12 feet. It's majestic. And if you ever get to the Denver airport and find the first concourse, it would be worth searching this out. Several of my friends have found it, and they're awed by it. They complained that the butterfly Jesus called the house and said, you know, you've only painted one of the wings. And and he got really upset, and I won't go I won't go into the conversation, but you know again he he had said what he had to say, and I mean you can figure out the other wing, you know. This is a piece called Hamblecha, and it was done when he was extremely ill, and he was afraid to go into the sweat as years went by because of his lungs and because of his breathing, but he wanted to portray his own spirit in, in darkness and in innocence, and then he put what he called his Oscar Howe flashes around it. And, and that spirit in prayer and then going into the sweat lodge for purification and, and confronting the person's own demons and the person's own fears and the person's own darkness and coming out of the experience purified. He couldn't do it physically, but he sure could do it with paint. And in the end, I think, what's the difference? 
he did a whole series of altar pieces. They were very important to him, this altar series. He went back to it over and over. Chad Nielsen has this skull. It hung in his studio for years. And he took a picture of it with its shadow. And it's, he, I personally have seen him use this theme at least 20, 30 times. And, and again, it was to reiterate the power of the culture and the power of the old religion and the power of the buffalo. This one is out at Okta Lakota Museum. It's a triptych. Here's another one of that series. He was getting sicker when he painted this one. It's called Four Crow, and that's why he put the sweet grass in. At the last minute, just before it was going out the door, actually, literally, he said, wait, you know, and he, he ran in and, and painted that, that braid of sweet grass and the prayer. He did a series which he felt was his most important work, which was called Urban Indian. It was based on his own life and the frustration that he felt being a full blood and coming from a traditional culture where English was not his first language and all of a sudden being thrust into a completely different world and having to somehow cope with that while maintaining his own integrity as a Native American. So what he would usually do is put a young version of himself on the left and an older, perhaps more jaded version of himself on the right. This theme he came back to over and over and over throughout his career. This is one of the early ones and Judge Pearsall has this one, I believe. This is another one from roughly around the same period. He always has himself coming through a door, and behind him is his culture. Behind him is the rosebud. Behind him is his family and his traditions and, and everything on back into history. And then before him is the dominant culture that he found himself a part of and, and wanted to be a part of but it was never easy for him to do it. He would go back and forth and slam that door a lot of times. This is another one from that series. That small picture of him on the left is the first picture that I showed you. He, he painted that from that black and white photo of him when he was first here. And he was older and the symbolism was starting to creep into these and the bricks were starting to go away as he was coming to terms with the life he had chosen for himself. This is one of the last ones that he did. It's called Sweetgrass, and it was painted out at the farm. In fact, behind this painting is the farm. You don't know it, but it's there. He painted the whole farm and his pickup truck and the dog and the grove and everything, and then he painted this over it. But his foundation for those years was that farm, and it really shows in this piece particularly because he put in more of nature and he, and he was actually more at peace there than I think he'd ever been in his life. He was happier there, definitely, than he'd ever been. <coughs> this was a piece he did in honor of Dr. Howe. And I believe it's in Sioux Falls at a bank. It's very large, it's about three by four five, six feet. I don't know what bank. They keep changing their names. I can't keep them straight. And of course this is the sisters. It's something he worked on for years. Even when I first met him and he was sitting under it, he still hadn't finished it. He, he finished it here. And uh, Chad Nielsen bought it, and I'm so glad he did. And then prints were made out of it, and I'm glad they were, because a lot of people have been able to share this image. In fact, the, the Omaha tribe gave a, a framed picture of this to Hillary Clinton when they went back to ask for more money for the tribe. And all the tribes went together, and she usually gives everything to the Smithsonian, but she wouldn't give this one away. She said, no, I'll, as long as I'm in the White House, I want to keep this one. <laughs>